The Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs blames the recent wave of hiking pump prices on the fluctuation in the currency exchange rates. As most countries continue vaccinating their people, Africa CDC says India's COVID-19 surge may affect vaccination distribution in Africa. An IEC plans for national voter registration and advanced stage four months towards the presidential elections. These and more coming on the world today. Do stay with us. Good evening, viewers. You're watching the World Today newscast here on Africa TV with my Sohna Tunka. And now to our news in detail. The recent increment in fuel prices, drivers are left devastated with the situation as they wonder how longer will the upward slope continue, with exception to the reduction announcement in prices of fuel in May 2020. The trend had been in the opposite direction with barely any justification to hard time in the transport sector. Now, the Ministry of Financing and Economic Affairs has, however, blamed the recent wave of hiking pump prices on the fluctuation in the currency exchange rates. More of that in this report. Within the span of three months, the price of fuel pumps have increased to more than 10 Gambian dollars. Drivers have since the latest increment of prices lamented the need for the government to justify the rapid trend in the hiking prices of fuel in the Gambia. Ibrahim Ajalo, communication officer at the Ministry of Finance, explained the major causes of fuel price increment on the foreign exchange market. What Gambians need to understand, one, Gambia is not uh, an oil producing country. And then oil prices are based on the international market price. Because if you look at it in the Gambia here, three factors are responsible uh, for price increment. Or reduction. First is the international fuel prices at the international market. Second is uh, the exchange rate, Gambia dollar, dollar to dollar, and the third is taxes. So the first two are very crucial in this, because if prices of fuel at the international market increase, and the exchange rate, dollar to Gambia, the, from from dollar to dollar also increases, obviously, uh, taxes will also increase. And when taxes increase, then there's no way. Fuel also has to increase. With the frequent increment in fuel prices, as Mr. Jal explained, resulted from the monthly pegging of fuel prices in the international market. Fuel prices uh, are pegged at the, end of, at the beginning of every month. Like not today you wake up, you find our fuel prices have increased. Now, if the fuel price, for example, uh, let's say 47 dollars per liter in a particular month, it doesn't change until the month ends. When it goes like that, until the month ends, then fuel prices are also calculated based on what is obtained from the international market. Just like, like I told you, these are the main reasons. These are three main factors are responsible. One, uh, price in the international market. Once it is, it increases there, and also the exchange rate increases. We know that you know the, the dollar is depreciating every now and then, and the dollar is constantly appreciating. The more the dollar appreciates over the dollar, and prices increase in the internal, international market, then that affects taxes. When taxes are affected, then domestic fuel price also changes. The global demand for oil has been increasing, outpacing any gains in oil production and excess capacity. This is mainly due to rapid development projects in developing nations, especially China and India, whose economies have become increasingly industrialized and urbanized, thereby increasing the world demand for oil. In addition, fear of supply disruptions has been spurred by turmoil in oil-producing countries such as Nigeria, Venezuela, Iraq and Iran in recent years. The fuel prices in the Gambia are such that the cost of petrol increased from $47.03 to $52.03 while diesel rose from $46.64 to $50.64. Reporting for iAfrica News, I am Mariama Cham. 
The Ministry of Finance and Economic Affairs says the recent increment of fuel prices is as a result of fluctuation in the currency rate. Now, President Adam Abaro has on Thursday embarked on an unannounced visit to a 32 million euro fuel facility at Mandina Ring to familiarize himself with the progress of ongoing operations there. The government leader also visited ministries of higher education, interior, and that of works. We have more of that in this report. The fuel facility once administered by the Chinese is now controlled by Gambians. President Barrow says he sent a surveillance team to the site prior to his coming to see how the place is being administered. The unannounced visit is to ascertain by himself the realities on the ground. He has some contentment in the administration and says the facility is crucial to national security and needs protection. It's a big investment and we wanted to secure it. We are very concerned about national security and this is part of national security. That's why we adopted a policy that we want to manage it with Gambians leading. So that's why I was involved and today I seized the opportunity to come and visit the GAM Petroleum. I am very happy and excited to be here. I have made certain observations, but if we get to the office, sit down with technicians and discuss about uh, this institution. The president has not said anything about increment in fuel price during his visit to this facility. In April this year, petrol price increased from $47 to $52 while diesel rose from 46 to 50 dollars C. And currently, diesel price stands at 55 dollars per liter. Drivers are still demanding an explanation from the government for the increment. Barrow also visits the Ministry of Works and urges for speedy construction of the OIC roads as the rainy season approaches. All the time we are asking for contractors who will work 24 hours. But it's like three shifts. I think that will be the only way we can do it quickly and fast. If you are talking about 24 months, if you divide it to three shifts, you know, every day it's like you are covering three days. So you can do it fast and you want quality because this is a project that should be a lifetime project. That's why it is very, very expensive, 22 kilometers, but you're talking about $83 million. I think it's not small money. You know, people will be talking about roads, but it's not easy to build, build roads. Yeah, but I think it's high time we start to do that and expand our roads. Yes. The 32 million gram petroleum terminal at Mandina Ring consists of 17 fuel tanks with a storage capacity of 51,000 metric tons of fuel, as well as liquid propane gas LPG. It has 19 loading bays for tanker trucks. It also has gigging and metering equipment, fully equipped with LPG bottling plant and three offshore pipelines. Reporting for Air Africa TV, this is Omar Ahmadou Toure. From the report by Omar Ahmad Toure, we move to Africa CDC, where a growing concern among African leaders, including Africa CDC, that the increasing of COVID-19 cases and deaths in India could affect the ongoing coronavirus vaccine rollout in the continent. The Asian country's decision to stop vaccine exports may further hinder the progress of the ongoing vaccination program in different countries. And despite the worries, the African leadership could now rely on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine after initial agreement with the South African firm. Details in this report. The unexpectedly rising COVID-19 new cases and death due to the pandemic in India continue to worry the African continent. What's even worse is, due to the decisions of the Indian authorities to halt vaccines exports, African vaccination plans remain in jeopardy. There is no doubt that the India situation, as we have discussed, on this uh, platform already uh, has severely impacted uh, the predictability of the rollout of our vaccination programs and will continue to do so for the near, uh, coming weeks and, and, and perhaps months. But there is also good news. Because of the arrangements made earlier with Johnson & Johnson, Africa could receive at least 120 million doses of vaccines soon. That supply will start uh, hopefully, and uh, not well, not hopefully, but uh, the agreement and the contract uh, says this, it will start delivery the first uh, quarter, uh, the, the, the beginning of the, the third quarter. So I think that is uh, what we have in our hands, and um, we are doing all we can to um, address the situation 
uh, from the African Union side uh, 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 as much as possible. Africa so far has received close to 32 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines with about 18 million doses administered already. That number is too low compared to the more than 1.4 billion people residing in the continent. So for now, Africa is advised to focus on strengthening COVID-19 preventing measures until enough vaccine doses are secured. The current chairperson of the African Union, who is also president of DR Congo, Felix Sishakedi, will be hosting a continent-wide meeting which will bring all health ministers of member nations. This emergency gathering, which will take place by the end of this week, has aimed to put the continent on alert and discuss what Africa must do to collectively ensure that a spike of corona cases like in India will not happen in the continent. The Gambia's Independent Electoral Commission has assured that it is on the right footing for the National Voter Registration Exercise scheduled for end of May despite challenges along the way. The voter registration according to the schedule issued by the Commission in April will run through the beginning of July 2021 across the country. Bintajalo tells us more. The latest schedule, unlike the previous one, will go ahead as planned, according to the country's Electoral Commission. Mid of January was the initial date for the commencement of the 2021 voter registration, but the schedule was removed to end of May thanks to logistical constraints. Director of Training and Communication of the IEC, Pama Kamkan, hinted iAfrica on the level of preparedness to kick off with the voter registration. Uh, right now, we, we're not relenting. We're working fast as well to catch up uh, with the days. Because right now, as you can see, uh, the office is virtually empty. Most of the senior staff uh, and the chairman, the chairman of the IEC, are on a uh, tour around the country uh, to meet uh, with local authorities, uh, stakeholders in the, in the electoral process. In this case, particularly, we're talking about the local authorities. This include the chiefs, uh, the governors, uh, uh, and, and other local authorities. So this is uh, part of the uh, preparations that are being undertaken to engage people or to engage stakeholders so that they can be informed and aware of uh, uh, the plans that uh, are ongoing with regards to the voter registration exercise. Mr. Khan said that the Commission has other programs such as the photo education, engagement with artists, training of registration staff, which will begin in earnest after which voter registration staff would be selected. Uh, as of now, we just uh, we did the interviews and testing of uh, the candidates who applied uh, to be hired as voter registration staff. We just completed last week. So currently we are in the process of finalizing, doing the final selection uh, of those staff. So I hope we'll have the numbers. Of course, uh, we have some criteria which all the staff need to meet. And this is that they have to have a background in IT studies. So we're trying to make sure that the people we hire are conversant um, with, uh, with IT. Because as you know, this is a biometric system, and we will be using the, the computer, mainly computer laptops. So we ensuring that staff uh, have a good background on IT, so that they can be easily trained on the job, and then so that they can also deliver effectively. Mr. Ken explained mechanisms are in place to prevent major problems during the process. Accordingly, the Commission is in dialogue with community and stakeholders to raise public awareness on the importance and other basics about the whole exercise. Time being one of the major challenges for the meantime, the Commission official is hopeful that effective work would be delivered within the schedule with the cooperation of all Gambians. For iAfrica News, Binte Jalo. The trial of 37 suspects to terror attacks against citizens in the northern province of Rwanda in 2019 is before the military high court. Among them, 10 are from other countries, including Malawi, Uganda, and Burundi. 
they face charges of creating an illegally armed group, terrorism, murder, and conspiracy with a foreign government to overthrow elected government. Tells us more. In 2019, a group of unknown assailants equipped with great weapons, including knives and guns, attacked a village in the Mozanzi district of northern Rwanda. The prosecution said some of them carried out the attacks in Kinijini in northern Rwanda in September 2019, killing 15 people and injuring 14 others. Kinijini sector holds the headquarters of Volcano National Park for Endangered Mountain Gorillas. Among the other charges they face include complicity in armed robbery as well as attempted murder. Some of the accused admitted to what they have been accused of, while others have denied the charges of terrorism and murder. Some confess to have been recruited into this group under the guise of getting employment opportunities in the mining sector, something the prosecution have refuted as attempt to evade the gravity of their involvement in the crimes committed. The prosecution highlighted the role of the security forces in Burundi and Uganda providing evidence on how these people obtained documents allowing them to cross into the country. In July 2020, 36 appeared in court asking for bail and the 37th among them, Sergeant Emmanuel Ngirishuti, alias Kaniye Mara, was able to escape and is still at large. They are responsible for attacks on unarmed civilians in villages of Kinigini and Musansi sector during the night of the 15th October 2019, killing at least 15 people and injuring 14. They also looted property. Some of the suspects were captured during the attack in Musansi, while others were apprehended by the UN peacekeepers and Congolese military during operation against armed group operating in the country. The trial is expected to continue on Wednesday and Thursday this week. For our Africa News, I am Fatma Takasi. We will now go with a short commercial break. More news to come on the world today. Stay tuned. The pride we take in our brand, the work we put into constantly change the landscape and elevate real estate in the Gambia, it's compared to none. From inception, our goal was to add value to the beautiful Gambian landscape. That's why we are proud innovators of community estates. Kololi Sands is an exceptional piece of work, tailored for ultimate convenience and luxury, to bring you an element of finesse that is rare but unique in its own. This is also our pride and joy, and we welcome you to the exquisite beauty right here in Kololi and right here on the waterfront. Kololi Sands, feel the ocean breeze at your doorstep. They say we slept in one world and woke up in another. This global tragedy got humans together despite our social distancing. Our nature is taking a break. And giving us a wake up call on what and who truly matters. Look around you, hold on. Breathe, count your blessings, take time for self-renewal, for a better start tomorrow. Soon, life will be back. Meanwhile, let's stand apart together with one heart. Welcome back. If you're just joining, this is the World Today Newscast here on Africa TV. And now to our remaining so stories. A Gambian Senegalese human rights activist, Fatou Jeng Senghor, said former President Yahya Jame recreated another image of himself during the political impasse. 
The prominent human rights defender made the remarks as she appeared before the Thruge Commission on Thursday to give her testimony on the rights violation and freedom of expression that occurred during Jammes' era. The ACC files in this report. Freedom of expression and enjoyment of rights were curtailed during the presidency of Yahya Jame, despite the establishment of human rights policy. And Article 19, which entails freedom of expression and access to information. Media practitioners and citizens in the Gambia were obstructed from expressing their views. This forced many journalists and right activists to go into exile with Senegal being the popular destination. Prominent among them is Gambian Senegalese human rights activist Fatou Jang Senghor. She explained her activism journey with Article 19. Article 19 is a human rights organization. Mom Nagbed Nambota, I agree with you on the ELF Dom Adamala. Focusing uh, on freedom of expression and access to information. Nga Hamneni Nagdelen Mundita Sikibarsi, I see Sago, Nit Akitemen Munajot I Batarel. The organization takes its name from Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 19, the Article 19, Article 19, the 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 United Kingdom. the Article 19, the United Kingdom. the Article 19, the Article 19, the Article Precisely Johannesburg. In Jelben, Nakaya, South Africa, you get general Aldal, the Johannesburg, the capital. As we speak today, the organization has different regional offices. Chief Jamano Jini Wahninak, Buntilige Kaibu, Amna I Office Uberi Situndui. Three of them on the continent. Nyatunak Nekiti Diwani Africa. One in Senegal for West Africa. In January 2017. The Gambia was plunged into a protracted political crisis after the then incumbent president, Yahya Jambe, rejected the election results in late 2016. Mrs. Senghor explained the steps taken by her organization to address the issue. So when he uh, changed his mind, I think uh, we were all shocked. Yeah. And, uh, we realized that we have to start again. What was the reaction of the country when he changed his mind? Yes. Of the country? I was already in, uh, back in Dakar in the night. And uh, we started to talk to many Gambians in and we started to talk to many Gambians, including the coalition. But I think the first thing was safety. Uh, our people were, were people safe because, of course, uh, we were more concerned about what next, you know. And uh, in, in, in Senegal, Senegal, so we quickly mobilized. Uh, some of us uh, met. Especially those working in the media. In some. Fatou Jain Senghor is a Gambian Senegalese human rights activist, lawyer, and freedom of expression advocate. She is well known for her work in human rights in West Africa, especially in the Gambia. Mrs. Senghor was the director of Article 19 West Africa, based in Senegal. She has more than 18 years' experience working on human rights issues in Africa. Reporting for IAFRICA News, I am DCC. Now, due to its growing population in a southern African country, Zimbabwean authorities have sold hunting rights of 500 elephants. The move has, however, triggered debate among citizens as to what could the country benefit from such decisions. As of 2014, Zimbabwe is said to be hosting over 80,000 elephants, which some believe is causing threat to people while they are destroying their own habitat. Between May and October each year, hundreds of wild animals are fair game for trophy hunters. The most prized targets are lions and elephants. This year, Zimbabwe is selling hunting rights for over 500 of the latter because it says there are too many of them. The numbers are there. 
And I think there's enough evidence to say our elephants in Southern Africa, they are overpopulated. In fact, the elephants are becoming a danger unto themselves in terms of destroying their own habitat. The evidence is there. If you visit Wange today, it's not what it was 20, 30 years ago. A 2014 census showed Zimbabwe was home to over 83,000 elephants, a population that has been growing at an estimated 5% per year. Deprived of revenue it could generate by selling its ivory stockpile, the country sees hunting quotas as an important source of money for conservation. Proponents of trophy hunting say it brings in income which helps communities that live adjacent to and bear the brunt of conflicts with the wild animals. However, opponents say the benefits are overstated. Over the years, uh, we have seen um, issues to do with corruption at community level. We have seen even communities are actually complaining that they are not getting any benefits from uh, this process. Controversial hunts value at national level has also been questioned. There are some researches which you can check on. Uh, they are indicating that trophy hunting per se brings contributes around 0.3% to the national economy. Um, it is tourism where people come in to view, not to uh, hunt. That is bringing much needed fiscus into the national economy. The raging debate poses important questions. If you were to go to a community member who has lost their crops due to wildlife, to a community member who, lo who lost their loved one due to an attack, maybe by an elephant, you will understand that yes, we really need to look at trophy hunting. How do we make it more sustainable? How do we ensure that the benefits reach communities this time around? The government is revamping a rural community resource management program to address the concerns. We now end tonight's news bulletin. You can catch up with Mariama Cham on Gambia 24 at 20 hundred hours for more national stories. I'm Sona Tunkara. Thanks for watching and bye for now. Star GSM Electronics. Space